All right, here we go. So today we're talking about emergencies during pregnancy, which is a massive topic because there are so many emergencies during pregnancy. So I am only covering some of them because I have less than an hour. Um, the way that I thought to break this down was thinking of like, what are the patients coming in with? Like what's their chief complaint? So I think of the hypertensive patient, which is the bulk of this lecture, um, the patient with right upper quadrant abdominal pain or epigastric abdominal pain, the patient with a headache, the short of breath patient, the febrile patient, and then the bleeding patient. But the bleeding patient is its own future lecture that's an hour long. So we're not gonna talk about any of these complications today. So the most of this lecture will be hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. And then the other topics are just going to be sort of like reminders to think about these differentials, um, but not, not like diving deep into the topics because again, they can be their own hour lecture. Um, so hypertensive disorders of pregnancy is divided into gestational hypertension, preeclampsia, eclampsia, chronic hypertension, and chronic hypertension with superimposed preeclampsia. So why do we care about this? We care about this because 16% of all maternal deaths are attributed to hypertensive disorders. We also care about this because the patients can look really well. Like this woman looks very healthy and like nothing's wrong with her. And she um, could actually have preeclampsia, which is a life-threatening um, diagnosis. So we have to pay attention very closely to our pregnant patient's vital signs. Um, also our postpartum patients up to six weeks because this can occur postpartum. So again, get a blood pressure on every pregnant patient and postpartum patient, no matter what they're coming in for. The cutoff for normal for pregnant patients is going to be 140 over 90. Um, if you ever have any patient that has one or both of these out of range, you have to do workup to consider preeclampsia. So you have to get blood work and urine. Um, if their blood pressure is sign significantly elevated, which for pregnant patients, that's considered 160 or a diastolic of 110, then we have to quickly give them medications to reduce the risk of stroke. And this, these numbers, although they, to me, they don't look scary in a normal person, these are considered hypertensive urgency in a pregnant patient. So first we'll define uh, gestational hypertension. And this is going to be a blood pressure greater than 140 over 90 that's taken on at least two occasions, four hours apart in a patient that previously had a normal blood pressure. And now after she's 20 weeks of gestation, she has um, an elevated blood pressure. So the cutoff of 20 weeks. Then we might think that in the emergency department, we're never going to like check someone's blood pressure and then four hours later, check it again. So thankfully, if their pressure is really high, 160 over 110, um, then we can just assume that they have gestational hypertension as long as we recheck it within like five to 10 minutes and it's still elevated. And then we can go ahead and start antihypertensive therapy. The important thing is that 50% of patients with gestational hypertension will develop preeclampsia. And most of these patients will be put on baby aspirin to try to prevent them from getting preeclampsia. So we also have chronic hypertension, which is just patients that have hypertension before 20 weeks. And then chronic hypertension with superimposed preeclampsia, which is just chronic hypertensive patient that eventually gets preeclampsia. So how do we diagnose or define preeclampsia? <clears throat> and <clears throat> the diagnosis or definition is a patient that has gestational hypertension and then also either has proteinuria or signs of end organ damage. So um, these are all your criteria. And in red, you see the criteria for severe features of preeclampsia. 
So again, blood pressure is elevated or it's severely elevated plus proteinuria. So you have to get a urinalysis on these patients. You can theoretically get a 24 hour urine collection, which I don't think any of us will do, but we can also do a protein to creatinine ratio and the cutoff is 0.3. Um, and then can also do a urine dipstick. And if it shows more than two plus protein, that's abnormal. Even if their urinalysis is normal though, if they have evidence of end organ damage as below, um, they can still have preeclampsia. So thrombocytopenia, acute renal dysfunction, which is defined as a creatinine of greater than 1.1, or if their baseline creatinine is doubled. Um, and elevated liver enzymes, or simply having severe right upper quadrant abdominal pain or epigastric pain that is not relieved by medications. So all they have to have is abdominal pain and they can have preeclampsia um, if they have this blood pressure. Pulmonary edema and also any cerebral symptoms. So any headache or vision changes. Our definition of eclampsia is going to be preeclampsia, so elevated blood pressure plus proteinuria or end organ damage plus a seizure. Again, it can occur up to six weeks postpartum, and then we'll talk about the treatment later. So here's an example. A previously healthy pregnant patient in the late third trimester presents with a new onset severe headache that was not relieved by Tylenol or acetaminophen. Blood pressure is elevated to 156 over 111. So this lady can walk into your emergency department and look like this, very happy, and she has a normal neurologic exam. All her other vitals are normal. And just this tells you that she has preeclampsia with severe features because her diastolic blood pressure is greater than 110. So that qualifies as a severe feature. And then also just having this new onset severe headache is a severe feature. Um, and in patients that have preeclampsia with severe features, one in 50 of them will develop eclampsia and start having seizures. So it's very important that we in the ER recognize this. Um, so just to talk about some of the symptoms that they may present with that I thought was interesting. So hypertension, only 20, or sorry, 25% of these patients that have eclampsia can come to your emergency department with a normal blood pressure. So if you ever have a pregnant patient that has some vague complaint, like a headache or blurred vision or right upper quadrant abdominal pain, epigastric pain, um, or just feeling nauseated or whatever, you have to check your labs and your urine. Um, the labs, it's pretty simple. The minimum test required is a CBC and then a CMP to check your renal function and your liver enzymes and a urinalysis to check your protein. So CBC, CMP, urinalysis. Of course, if they have like severe disease, then you can add on these other tests, but they're not necessary for the acute uh, most patients. So the treatment of preeclampsia in the emergency department our uh, responsibility is going to be maternal resuscitation, blood pressure control, and starting magnesium sulfate for seizure prophylaxis. Magnesium can more than half the risk of progression to eclampsia, so it's crucial. And we also have to control their blood pressure rapidly because they have such a high risk of stroke. The definitive treatment, of course, is going to be delivery. So you need to get OB involved early. So a pregnant patient comes into the ED with elevated blood pressure. What should you do? The first thing that you should do is confirm that their blood pressure is actually elevated. So tell the nurse or um, whoever to repeat the blood pressure in like five to 10 minutes to confirm that it's actually that high. Make sure they have the appropriately sized blood pressure cuff and the patient is in the right position. If the repeat pressure is still greater than 160 uh, systolic, or if their diastolic is greater than 110, then we have to give antihypertensive medications. Um, simultaneously, while you're getting your blood work and your urine um, is sent off to the lab. So there's no consensus on an initial ideal agent, 
but all of these are considered first line treatments. So labetalol, hydralazine, or immediate release nifedipine. And so nifedipine is the only oral option. These are IV. Um, there is no like exact criteria or recommendations on which one of those to choose, but a rough guideline of what you can choose is through the concept of pulse pressure and our like systemic vascular resistance and cardiac output. So if we remember way back when to medical school, pulse pressure is our systolic blood pressure minus diastolic blood pressure. And our blood pressure depends on our systemic vascular resistance and cardiac output. So if their pulse pressure is greater than 65, so like if their blood pressure is say 200 over 100, then we think that we need to decrease their cardiac output. So we should give a beta blocker such as labetalol. Alternatively, if their pulse pressure is less than 65, so like 200 over 150, then we need to decrease their systemic vascular resistance. So give a vasodilator such as hydralazine or nifedipine. Again, this is not definitive and like for sure certain, but it's just something to consider when you choose your medicine. Our goal is to get their blood pressure less than 160 over 90. And many hospitals have protocols for what medicines they use. Um, so I don't know if you all have protocols at your hospitals or not, <clears throat> but this is the protocol that I've used in the past. So the part that we need to remember is like the, it's like the 2010 rule or 1020 rule. So if you start with labetalol, you're gonna give them a bolus of 20 milligrams in 10 minutes, recheck their blood pressure. If it is not meeting the goal, then you're gonna double this dose and give them 40 milligrams. 10 minutes later, repeat their blood pressure. If it's not meeting the goal, double the dose. So give them 80 milligrams. And then you can do this 80 milligram one two times. So 10 minutes later, give them another 80 milligrams. Then your maximum dose over 24 hours is gonna be 300 milligrams. It's important to remember that labetalol should probably be avoided in someone with moderate to severe asthma, heart disease, heart block, and bradycardia. Your hydralazine is going to be kind of the opposite of labetalol. So you're going to do 10 milligram bolus and then repeat the blood pressure in 20 minutes. If it's still elevated, give another 10 milligram bolus. Um, you can only give two doses of hydralazine though. So if you give two doses of hydralazine and they're still hypertensive, then you need to switch to maybe give them labetalol the next time or nifedipine the next time. And then nifedipine, your oral option is going to be 10 milligrams orally. Again, it's 20 minutes later, repeat, and then you can give them another 10 to 20 milligrams, another 20 minutes later, et cetera. So we've managed their blood pressure with those medications, and now we have to give them magnesium for preeclampsia. So for magnesium, you're going to give a four to six gram IV bolus that infuses over 15 to 20 minutes. And then you're going to start a drip. So a continuous infusion at two grams per hour. So bolus of four grams over 20 minutes, and then a drip at two grams per hour. If the patient develops a seizure, despite being given these medications, you're going to give them another bolus of magnesium of two grams. Um, this is important to remember because if you have a patient that has eclampsia, 10% of them will have another seizure. So just remember you have to give them another two grams of IV magnesium. And then if you get into a situation where a like, patient comes into your emergency department actively seizing, your story is that they are like two weeks postpartum, then you need to assume that they have eclampsia um, and they probably don't have IV access established. So you can give it intramuscularly by giving 10 grams and you need to give five grams IM in each buttock. Um, important to know that if you do it intramuscularly, there are higher rates of adverse effects. We have to watch out for hypermagnesemia. 
Um, and so we have to monitor their levels and, but more importantly, monitor them clinically. So one thing that we're supposed to do is check their reflexes because loss of patellar reflexes is one of the very first signs of hypermag. Um, also, if your patient complains of muscle weakness, then that should be concerning to you. Monitor their vital signs, so their respiratory rate, their blood pressure, watch for hypotension, watch their urine output. And if the patient develops symptomatic hypermagnesemia, you need to stop the infusion and give them um, calcium gluconate. So it's 10% and it's 1.5 to 3 grams. Also, if the patient has cardiac arrest, which is possible from the magnesium, you give them calcium chloride, one gram IV. Once your mo the mom is stabilized, we got her blood pressure fixed, we gave her magnesium, then we need to look at the baby. So make sure we document a fetal heart rate and we can do that with our bedside ultrasound or the nurses can find it with the Doppler often. Um, and then if possible, you can also use the ultrasound to say, is the patient, is the baby like breech? Are they vertex? And of course we need to get OBGYN team on board early. Disposition is definitely going to be to admit these patients. They are not discharged home um, because again, the definitive treatment is going to be delivery. So that's, that is like the, the bulk of the lecture. Um, so I'll pause for a second and like, do you, does anybody have any questions right now or should we go on? And I can't see the chat. We good? Okay, I'm just gonna start talking. All right, so now we'll talk about the pregnant patient with right upper quadrant abdominal pain. So pregnant patient, um, 32 years old, G2P1, currently 34 weeks pregnant, presents with nausea, vomiting, and right upper quadrant abdominal pain. Her blood pressure is 130 over 82. What four life-threatening diagnoses must you consider in a pregnant patient, particularly coming in with right upper quadrant abdominal pain? Um, and you could probably think of a lot of things, but for pregnant people in particular, preeclampsia, because remember that preeclampsia can solely present with right upper quadrant abdominal pain, help syndrome, um, acute fatty liver disease of pregnancy, which is life-threatening. And then of course, cholecystitis or biliary pathology, like in any patient that's non-pregnant even. So I'm not going to cover this today because that's the, pretty much the same for a pregnant versus non-pregnant patient, you know, ultrasound surgery. We already talked about preeclampsia. So let's talk about HELP syndrome. So HELP syndrome is a severe variant of preeclampsia, um, but it can be atypical because patients don't have to have elevated blood pressure and they don't have to have proteinuria. They often present with right upper quadrant pain with malaise and half of them have nausea and vomiting. This is rapidly progressive and it's most commonly seen in 28 to 36 week of pregnancy. So it's hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes and low platelets. Why this happens is, is similar to preeclampsia. It's not known what the pathophysiology is, but it's thought to be due to abnormal vascular reactivity of placental and maternal vessels. So it causes utero-placental insufficiency and these reactions occur and basically they're higher sensitivity to vasoconstriction and proteins get leaky and et cetera, clots form. So in HELP syndrome, you have microangiopathic thrombosis that leads to this hemolytic anemia and liver, in, or liver damage. So um, this is our diagnostic criteria. So you need more than, greater than or equal to two of the following. So basically evidence of a hemolytic anemia. So you can see these uh, schistocytes on the blood smear elevated serum bilirubin, low haptoglobin, or anemia that's not explained by blood loss. You need elevated liver enzymes and low platelets. 
These patients are at risk for bleeding complications. So DIC, intracranial hemorrhage, placental abruption, and spontaneous hepatic or splenic hemorrhage. And this patient has a big giant hepatic hemorrhage. Hepatic hemorrhage can progress to hepatic rupture. And this is associated with a maternal and fetal mortality rate of over 50%. Management of health is, is basically identical to preeclampsia management. So blood pressure, magnesium sulfate, and delivery of the fetus. If the patient is so anemic from HELP syndrome that they need a blood transfusion, or if they have um, you know, hepatic or splenic hemorrhage and they're unstable, of course you, you give them blood and then you talk to surgery. But otherwise it's managed like preeclampsia. So what is another potentially life-threatening liver disease that occurs in the third trimester of pregnancy? And this is acute fatty liver of pregnancy. Um, this is something that I like totally forgot existed, but this is considered an uh, obstetric emergency. So we should remember it. These patients can have um, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, jaundice, anorexia, elevated liver enzymes, elevated lactate dehydrogenase, hyperammonemia, thrombocytopenia, hypoglycemia, coagulopathy, and kidney dysfunction. And this is due to this um, fetal long chain 3 hydroxyacyl coa dehydrogenase. Uh, this enzyme is deficient or not working correctly. And that's why their liver gets completely overloaded with fat. This is an obstetric emergency and it requires immediate delivery of the fetus. And then they potentially need a liver transplant. Okay, next really brief thing is gonna be the pregnant patient with headache. So for example, a 32 year old female, G2P1, currently 34 weeks pregnant, presents to the ED with a severe headache that was not relieved by acetaminophen. Her blood pressure is 130 over 82. What is your differential? So of course, our differential in her is going to include preeclampsia because just having a headache that's not improved by Tylenol or acetaminophen is a severe feature of preeclampsia. But let's say we send off our CBC, CMP, and urinalysis, and the patient does not have evidence of preeclampsia. Then we have to consider other causes of her headache in a pregnant patient. So of course, things like meningitis, it's gonna be the same as a non-pregnant patient. Um, idiopathic intracranial hypertension, the same. Uh, carbon monoxide poisoning. So, but the other things like something that you really, really have to think about in a pregnant person versus a normal person is the cerebral venous thrombosis. So that's what we will talk about. Also, there's pituitary apoplexy, and that is like a spontaneous hemorrhage of their pituitary gland from like the growth. Um, and then also subarachnoid hemorrhage. So a cerebral vein thrombosis. This is more common in anyone that's hypercoagulable, such as those on oral contraceptive pills, and then people with cancer, factor V Leiden, and then of course, any pregnant or postpartum patient. It can present really significant with like weakness and focal neurologic deficits, paresthesia, seizures, um, encephalopathy, or it can be super subtle and the patient can just say that they have a really bad headache and they, they've never have headaches, um, vomiting, some vague vision changes. So we have to think about this, like if you don't have any other reason for a pregnant patient's headache. Uh, the diagnosis is best made with MRV, magnetic resonance venography, or with CTV if you don't have MRV. The treatment is gonna be to anticoagulate them because it's basically a blood clot in their venous sinus in their brain. Um, one important thing to know though, is that one third of these patients will have intracranial hemorrhage that's so small that you won't see it on the CT scan. So before you start anticoagulating them, you might want to get an MRI of their brain to make sure they don't actually also have a brain bleed. This diagnosis is always stuck in my mind because in residency training, there was a, I was on ICU um, and there was a patient that was pregnant 
who went to her OBGYN two days in a row complaining of a really bad headache. They did not, they didn't document a neurologic exam. So we don't know if she had neuro deficits, like, because these people can have very vague, like cranial nerve palsies. So you want to make sure you do a really thorough neuro exam. But anyways, they did not document a neuro exam and they just told her, you know, keep taking Tylenol. It's fine. And then the next day she collapsed. She had a huge um, thrombus in her superior sagittal sinus that over the course of the days got so big, it actually her um, her venous sinus burst and she had a devastating massive brain bleed. So don't miss this diagnosis. Um, so next topic is the pregnant patient who is short of breath. So of course you think of all your normal things for a non-pregnant patient, like do they have COVID or flu or pneumonia or asthma, whatever, but the cannot miss diagnoses in a pregnant person is going to be your peripartum cardiomyopathy and your pulmonary embolism because they're hypercoagulable. So I'm not going to talk about these because these are their own topics, but peripartum cardiomyopathy, it's heart failure, right? Um, it's a dilated cardiomyopathy most commonly. So their ejection fraction will be less than 45%. And they're gonna present just like any heart failure patient. Um, it can develop in the last month of pregnancy and up to five months after the baby is born. So essentially you just give them the same medicines that you give someone with heart failure you just don't give them like an ACE inhibitor or um, an angiotensin receptor blocker, but you still can give them diuretics, can give them nitroglycerin. Um, and if you need to use pressors, like if they're hypotensive, then you can use norepinephrine. For pulmonary embolism, um, also remember that these patients can get amniotic fluid emboli. So think about PEs. So I think lastly, the pregnant patient who is febrile, again, you're going to think about all your normal things. Do they have COVID, flu, pneumonia, whatever, but a few top, a few pregnancy specific things that we have to think about is going to be, um, pyelonephritis. So obviously we're already checking a urinalysis on all these patients because we have to already worry about asymptomatic bacteriuria. But um, if they have a fever, consider pyelonephritis. And this has a risk of preterm labor. So we have to treat it aggressively. And so we're going to use ceftriaxone and admit them to the hospital. Chorioamnionitis. So this is an infection of the amniotic um, sac and placenta. This carries a risk of placental abruption. And this is treated with gentamicin and ampicillin. Endometritis, so this is going to be your postpartum patient, and this is the most common postpartum infection. This is especially risky in a patient that had a C-section. Their C-section patients are at 25 times higher risk than a vaginal delivery. And because of um, their like recent procedure, their recent birth, these patients, we have to worry about gas forming strep species like group A strep. So that's why we have to give them clindamycin instead of ampicillin. So it's treated with gentamicin plus clindamycin. Choreo is gentamicin plus ampicillin. Um, oh, and for endometritis, the question to ask your patient is going to be about their lochia. So what is like your vaginal, because um, you know, everybody after birth, they have some like vaginal discharge and bleeding. And so you have to ask them about that. And sometimes they'll describe it as being foul smelling because it's basically pus coming out of their uterus. Um, and then of course, mastitis. So that's infection of the breast. Um, most of the time, this is not very severe and they can just go outpatient on oral medications like dicloxacillin or Keflex or clindamycin. But if it is severe, then give them vancomycin. All right, so these are just a few practice questions that we'll go through. So somebody is gonna have to yell out these answers, okay? 
Um, a 21 year old woman, G1 P0 at 35 weeks gestation presents with headache, blurry vision and shortness of breath. Vital signs include a blood pressure of 195 over 110, heart rate of 90, respiratory rate 21, temperature normal and oxygen saturation 90%. Urinalysis reveals three plus protein. A chest x-ray reveals pulmonary edema. In addition to magnesium, which of the following medications should be administered to reduce blood pressure? Can't see the chat, so. Can somebody, um, Tell me. Can we get a spokesperson? Dr. Tao, can you tell me? Uh, in this case, I suggest the patient can get a free and let us yes. So, the uh, patient has a pulmonary edema. Uh, edema, after we can get uh, magnesium, we choose uh, hydralazine to control the pulmonary edema. We can yeah. uh, be very careful with furosemide. Furosemide can affect uh, for, uh, uh, for the baby as reduce the uh, and we don't use lots of time in the uh, rest station. So I choose C for control the uh, uh, blood stressors. Yep. And do you remember the dose of hydralazine? Hydralazine, uh, I remember that we need to follow 10 milligrams. And then we follow this uh, infusion. Yeah. About, uh, telegram. Yeah. Yeah. However, in uh, in our department, we don't get uh, hydralazine. We just can use the capitin to control the blood pressures. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So if you're doing hydralazine, it's 10 milligrams and 20 minutes later, repeat the blood pressure. If it's still high, give another dose of hydralazine. Or would you, what what agent did you say you use? Uh, usually in my department, we use nicaclidine. Nicaclidine. Sorry, you're, you're cutting out. Is it nifedipine? Nicardipine, sorry. Yeah, nicardipine. Oh, nicardipine. Oh, okay. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, you can put them on a nicardipine drip, or you can also give pregnant patients uh, nitroglycerin. That one's safe in pregnancy. All right. Good job. Next question. So a 19-year-old G1P0 pregnant woman at 28 weeks gestation presents to the ED with headache, blurred vision and repetitive vomiting. Her vital signs are normal temperature, heart rate 112, blood pressure 195, 145 over 90, respiratory rate 22. She has had no prenatal care due to lack of insurance. Her physical exam is notable for hyperreflexia and one plus pitting edema bilaterally. Dipstick urinalysis shows three plus proteinuria. She has started on first line medication to treat her condition. Which of the following symptoms of medication toxicity is most likely to manifest earliest? Dr. Nung, can you tell me? Or Dr. Who else do we have here? Dr. Chung or Dr. Tao again? Or Dr. Dai? Uh, 
in this some case we have you we use uh magnesium we get all way to check the uh the replace of the uh because uh hippo reflection very uh soon side when we when uh, the magnesium uh high is in the first side and the later sometimes patient feel a shock or print and maybe uh the gas uh uh can you have a rest yeah exactly you're right so loss of reflexes is the first sign so that was the correct answer and this is the little table to remind you good job all right last question which of the following emergencies should be suspected in a patient with known hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelet count syndrome of pregnancy who quickly develops severe right upper quadrant abdominal pain and hemodynamic instability? Dr. Tao, I think you're on a roll. Yeah, because in my department, sometimes we can uh, give uh, take the patient from another hospital, and sometimes they have a uh, health syndrome, and they have uh, when we check in department, sometimes they get uh, hepatic uh, ruptures, mm. and sometimes they get a uh, loss, uh, plus loss so much, and uh, so, uh, we can in this case, some case we try to do the DSA to stop the bleeding and move uh, the patient to the ICU. Take care. Yeah, that's great. Yep, you're exactly right. That's interesting that you you've seen. I haven't actually ever seen that. Um. Um. In my practice, let's see here. How do I stop? Screen sharing. Pause share. Can you see my my screen now? I don't know why this is so hard for me to use. Can you all still hear me? Um, can you hear me? Oh, okay, cool. All right. Well, anyways, so that, that's the end of the lecture. Um, does anybody have any questions or thoughts or cool cases or anything that you want to talk about? All right, well, that's all I have. Let me know if you guys do any ultrasound IVs or central lines or any ideas for future simulation labs that would be helpful. Thanks, Hannah. All right. Well, hope you guys have a wonderful day. Thanks. Yeah, I can, um, I'll send uh, the PowerPoint <clears throat> to like the group email that I usually send out. Yep, no problem. All right. Take care, everybody. See you. See you next week.